Benville Lady Tigers basketball coach Tom Hummeyer joining us on Talking Preps. Hello, sir, and congratulations, state champion. Well, I appreciate that. Uh, it's been a while, but uh, it, it sounds pretty good. Yeah, I would think so. Um, just how's it been? I mean, it came under obviously very unusual circumstances, but you all had an outstanding year, no question about it, and definitely – worthy of the Coast State Championship title, but has it taken a little getting used to? It, it has. You know, it's one of those deals where um, the ending was quite different, uh, but uh, we really enjoyed uh, the journey of it. You know, I really enjoyed it with the seniors and, and the team this year and, and uh, how well they prepared, how well – uh, they took care of business on a daily basis. Is it sunk in? I mean, how is it still seem kind of even now after everything that's gone on? Is it emotional? Not really. No. You know, it's a, it's still kind of it's one of those deals where you kind of think about it. And say, hey, that's cool. Then then it kind of goes back to the you know the, you start thinking of the journey that you have throughout the season, uh, the plays, the players. Uh, how they competed, uh, the teams they competed against, against some good teams, and and uh, those all those mem memories kind of come back, and uh, they're so since it's so fresh, uh, there's so many of them, and uh, it's just it's, it's it's a cool thing. Was it? I guess the hardest part is not being able to finish the journey in Hot Springs. Has how tough was that to kind of reconcile, or was it not really a problem at all? Well, at first it was, you know. Then I go ahead and, and like a split second later, I look at it. Let's not that. Let's not that or that situation take away what the seniors done or what the team has done. And uh, then I just then I look at the baseball players and softball players, soccer kids, track kids. They didn't have a senior year. And uh, so uh, at least we got an opportunity to be able to play 28 games. Uh, and you know what? There's only two basketball teams, you know, us and Fayetteville are the only two in our, in our conference, in our um, division that didn't get to play their last game. Everybody else did. So, yes, it was a little disappointing at first, but if you look at the big picture, uh, I get it. And, uh, and we're just thankful for what we got. Yeah, your team was so much fun to watch all year. And as we take a look at the photo from after the semifinal win in Bryant that punched the ticket to Hot Springs, just what what will you remember most about this group? The very first uh, time that I walked in to the locker room, uh, we're fixing to play Conway. All year long, you know, I kind of got on the kids a little bit about celebrating way too much before the game and let's be focused a little bit. And, you know, as the season went on, the way they played, that's who they were. And and going into that semifinal game, you know, of course, I'm nervous. I'm nervous for the kids, you know. And uh, when, I walked, when I opened that door, there, wasn't, there was no sound. They were all sitting there, quiet. And when I just looked at them, I mean, there was no pep talk. Those kids were ready to go. And that right there, just seeing that, it just gave me chills. And I knew, hey, we're going to be fine. These kids right here, they're going to compete and, and uh, give everything they have. And, and they did. And I was really, really, really proud of them. I was going to say, they came out and, they, and they, they were almost, it was just unbelievable to watch that performance against Conway. Um, and it was really that way all year. I mean, I know everybody gets caught up in Miriam, and she's an excellent player and has really progressed. But your team functioned as a unit, and it was just breathtaking to watch. It was uh, very balanced. You know, um, we have one of those situations where when you have Miriam as good as she is, uh, when she does her thing, you got to have players around her to be able to compliment her. And also Miriam has to compliment them. And uh, they just did a really good job of, um, of supporting one another, um, 
when one player has a bad game, the other four girls are doing a great job supporting them. And uh, it was just a t the team camaraderie, the support system was there. Um, and no one really cared who shot the ball. Everybody played well defensively, and uh, and they just supported one another. And it was it was a lot of fun. And not just the starters. It was it was it was, it was a team effort. And, uh, and it was one of those things. As a coach, it's fun to watch because uh, we had very little distraction. Um, and that's and that's that's saying a lot for our girls team. Yeah, I can. Yeah, I can imagine. Um, okay, you win the state title. Obviously, the next step we want to build on that. And now. We have it where there's a dead period through the end of May. Nobody can go anywhere and shoot. How, I mean, it's the reality of it, but it's got to be a little frustrating too, right? It is. It's, it's a little frustrating with me because, you know, despite I'm going to miss these seniors moving on, uh, playing college basketball or going to college, starting their next chapter in life, um, it's the young kids coming in, the freshman kids, just be able to have them be able to kind of mold in with the 10th grade and 11th graders of this year and just kind of start all over again and get the chemistry and the camaraderie and and uh, be able to uh, create those relationships so that way they'll be able to connect with one another. Um, that, that right there is a challenge, you know, in that aspect of it. Um, but I think once this is lifted, we're, we're, we're going to have to make up some lost time um, so that way we can be able to go ahead and get better off the court, so to speak, you know, because um, mm -hmm. they're going to take care of business on the floor. Uh, but you got to have that camaraderie off the court, be able to get along, because they spend a lot more time off the court than they do on the court. And so that part right there is very, very important. You think we'll see more um, hoops show up on driveways and on the side of the garage? Because – I mean, it's kind of rare. It used to be commonplace, but now you don't see them anymore. But it's it's kind of – if yeah. you don't have one, you can't go shoot anywhere. One thing I've noticed in our, in our neighborhood and in the surrounding neighborhoods up here in Bentonville is that if you have a basketball goal that kind of leads out into the on, on the road, um, they're, they're getting on to you. But now with this COVID, there's a lot of them facing down that road, and they're, they're just kind of backed off a little bit and and because uh, they know – they have to look at the big picture in terms of with these kids, they got to have an outlet. And right now, athletics is an outlet to a lot of these kids, and, and it's not available for them. Some people will say that the, it's it's not fun to be down, but with the kids playing sports constantly year round now, that this downtime may be a good thing for them just to let their bodies reset. Do you do you subscribe to that? Oh yeah, absolutely. I think the biggest. I think the I was listening while I was listening to the ESPN reporter one time. This is like last week. He said, right now, what's going on in our country, he feels like it's like his old summer when he was growing up as a kid. He said everything just kind of slows down a little bit. It kind of your body resets, your mind reset, and just kind of rest a little bit. And just be able to go ahead and be able to just kind of take time and just kind of reflect on certain stuff and, and uh, just kind of let your – you know, appreciate what you have and also to appreciate what you can't do right now. And, uh, and I think once it's all this stuff is lifted, I think uh, athletics is going to play a valuable sport. I see a huge jump in kids doing athletics uh, even more so uh, this next year simply because they just they just took it for granted. And, they, you know, it's a, it's a choice. It's an option. But now it's a, hey, was taken away from me. A lot of times you want you want that option. No, oh, no question about it. So what have you been doing to fill your time since you can't get into the gym? Oh, uh, you know, just do, do, doing a Google Hangout, stuff like that. And, you know, for years, you know, my wife has been on me doing projects around the house. And I said, well, honey, I'll get to it when I get time. Well, right now I got time. So that's what's happening right now. I'm just knocking out a little honeydew list here and there and, and, uh, and I'm not going very fast because, you know, the faster you go, the more she lines it up for you. Um, but we're just doing little projects around the house and just visiting with kids on, on Google Hangout and, and send, send them some workouts and things of that nature. Because kids nowadays, I mean, they'll get workouts from me. They'll get workouts from, you know, their uh, personal trainer and stuff like that. So we want to go ahead and double them up. Some of the kids kind of feel like they want to go back to school because they're working harder now than we're, when, they're, <laughs> when they're at school. <laughs> Oh, that's awesome. Have you had a chance to check out the Last Dance documentary? And if you have, 
kind of your thoughts on it so far? Oh, it's it's it's. I'm a I'm an '80s kid. Growing up in a small town, I watch NBA all the time. And uh, as a matter of fact, I watched more NBA in the '80s um, and early '90s. I did college basketball. And so I grew up with Michael Jordan. I remember all that stuff going on. And uh, it, was just, it just brought back a lot of memories, you know, uh, about what what they're talking about and things of that nature. I think the documentary is awesome. I think there's going to be tons more of those now. You know, I would love to see more like Elijah Wan and Larry Bird, all those uh, high-profile NBA players because – you know, this right here is really, really cool. That's what we always want to hear. We want to hear those stories on the inside, you know, how all this transformed and stuff like that. I remember Dennis Robin going to Vegas, and he was gone for several weeks. I thought that was – I just – you know, I've forgotten about that when they start talking about that. Hey, I do remember that. So the documentary is, is really, really cool. It is amazing to me to, to see behind the scenes because they – and we'll see a lot more of the stuff of the final season because they had the crew embedded – but it's still amazing to me that they broke that team up when they were still winning. Nobody had knocked them off. Yeah, I, I, don't, I didn't. I didn't quite understand that, you know, because it's kind of like they're. I don't know. They're probably the biggest. Oh gosh, it's just I just look at it with Pippen and with Jordan, all of them. You have, and the thing is, you had the two nucleus guys there. But you think about the first championship that they won. If I'm not mistaken, I think Jordan and Pippen were the, were the only ones left on that team when they won the sixth one, I think. I think you're and, right. And uh, so they just did a great job of just bringing in people, filling the spots. They lose one person, they get another person filling in. And, and uh, it's so dominating. You know, when they won those 72 games that year, that was that was a fun that was fun year because that's what that was a year my dad got the big uh, satellite dish, you know, those six oh, foot yeah. satellite dish. Yep. He got one of those. Man, I was in heaven. <laughs> and because uh, they had a lot of NBA games and stuff like that, this is way before the NFL. Uh, they had the package deal, you know. It's amazing too. Also, the drive that Jordan had. I mean, we always heard about it, but now to kind of see the footage behind the scenes and just see how driven he was. I mean, that was mm -hmm. truly incredible. He had a sense of edge that, that I haven't seen anybody, and he didn't care. You know what I'm saying? He wasn't – he just did a great job with the media in terms of being – staying out of the media, and he just talked about the play. I think you think of all the interviews that he's done, he's just, he was just – he was a professional um, person. And watching the documentary of his right now, he's real honest, real raw. So it's really nice to be able to hear what he is saying and uh, be able to listen to him. And uh, – but – when he played, he just, I mean, he had that competitive edge. He just wanted it, and and, uh, and he didn't want anybody to get in his way. And uh, he just, just how those, and those team and the, and the players that he played with, it's amazing what, um, how well they went ahead and conformed to him playing. Phil Jackson's style, obviously, very, he, he knew how to handle individuals and everything like that. Who influenced, your coaching style? Uh, oh, I would say Coach Blair. You know, uh, I looked at him when he was at U of A. I mean, he was an older guy at U of A, and, and he's a much older guy right now at A&M. And, and despite whoever, when he was with the uh, Ladybacks, whoever he played, he still uh, was intense. I mean, he still uh, got after the kids, and, and but in, in a good way to motivate them. And, uh, and I think all the competitors that knew him, they understood why he did that because he wants to be able to maintain that sense of uh, competitiveness throughout the whole game. And, uh, and I just like the style that he does on the floor, uh, way he kind of commands on the on the sidelines. And uh, I thought he just did a really good job in that area in terms of trying to get all the kids to respond and play hard. And he's still doing it and looks fabulous and shows no signs of slowing down. Is that something – do you plan on coaching that long or you just kind of take it year by year and see what happens? No, I do not have any desire to coach that long because it just takes so much energy. Now, with the kids I have, um, they're great kids, you know, uh, but it's, it's, it's not the actual coaching. It's not the actual practicing. 
It's just the it's the outside stuff in terms of how to handle certain kids. You know what I'm saying? Always kind of worrying about how this kid's going to respond here. Hey, I'm going to start this kid here. You know, I'm kind of dictating the kid's playing time. This kid right here works her tail off. I love the kid to death. I want a player, but I can't do it in the sense of I got to respect the team aspect of it in terms of she may not be the best piece for that. It, that type of stuff will drive me out of coaching, um, you know, simply because it's just seeing those kids. You look at those kids and, you know, nowadays they work so hard. There's so many. Uh, I love the fact that AAA has a two-week dead period. I would like to incorporate even more mm-hmm. um, because these kids work year-round and they, they work so hard to get the basketball season. And they may play, you know, gosh, four or five minutes. That's a lot. Of, that's the commitment. And uh, they really love the. It really takes a special person to be committed to a team for that long. Spe- speaking of that, it just made me think of this. You know, in the rush to get back in, is there a possibility you might overdo it and try to do too much too soon? Just from an from a physical standpoint, after having been idle, and now you try to ramp it up, and everybody's trying to catch up. There's a little bit of danger in that. Maybe the bodies just quite aren't ready. Larry, that, that's a very, very good question. I agree with that 100%. It's one of those deals where um, if they do open it back up in June, you know, say late June, everybody's going to have their tournaments, you know, in July. And a lot of these juniors coming in, this is their last hurrah. And uh, they want to go to those showcases. They want to be able to go to those tournaments because this is their last time to be able to show themselves in front of college coaches. And if they're playing on a good high school team, they want to be able to kind of create uh, that team camaraderie and that chemistry before the school season starts. So they're going to have a lot of minutes uh, playing in a short amount of time. And that's one thing I just kind of pray is that I hope, I hope is one of those deals where, all right, we're going to open this up, but hey, we're not going to have any team competition or anything else like that for at least two, three weeks. So that way their bodies are just, we got kids are working out, but it's a different type of workout, you know, and it, it takes a while for your body to get trained. And I love the fact that our kids are just taking time off. Like we talked about earlier, taking, taking that mental break, taking that physical break. And that's good. And, uh, but also too, let's not go ahead and jump right back into a competitive mode. Maybe a week later after everything's all opened up, that's, that's that might be detrimental to their body. Yeah. No question. Well, you have time to play our quick quiz real quick. Yeah, you bet. All right, here we go. Hold on. What is more likely to be on your playlist to be listened to right now, classic country or classic rock? Oh, classic rock. Who would who would be the 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 featured group? What you have right there, ACDC. It'd be one of those. Uh... There are about four or five songs that I love. We always use those during our workouts. And our kids get sick and tired of listening to it. But, <laughs> you know, they're ones doing the workout, but I'm enjoying listening to music. And it still holds up. Yeah. No question They just about reinvent it. themselves every year. Yes. All right. Most likely to watch tonight, Hulu or Netflix? Oh, Netflix. Okay. Definitely bring- Netflix. All right. Tonight, Ozark or Tiger King? I've already, uh, I've already watched Ozark. I, matter of fact, I watched both of them already. So uh, I like watching Tiger King because it's just a train wreck. Yes, happen. It's so it's so entertaining and and uh, I kind of feel like uh, Lead Hill. I I may have a couple neighbors who are, who's like the Tiger King. <laughs> <laughs> How surprised were you at the ending of season three of Ozark? Did you see it coming? No, I did not. I did not. It was, it, was, it was pretty good. I like it because now they're going to be a season four. Yes. And, Ho- uh, but, yeah, it, was, it totally caught me off guard. Yeah. And, and also the nice reference in, se- in season two about 40 minutes of hell with Nolan. Yeah. Which was kind of cool. Yeah. All right. Games tonight at your house. More likely to be Monopoly or Uno? I would like playing the Monopoly, but my kids, they always like to play the Uno part because I think their attention span is so uh, is uh, lacking. So I think Monopoly will put them to sleep. So I, I think we'll probably go with Uno. Okay. And our final question, maybe the most important question, best wrestler of all time, Hulk Hogan or Ric Flair? 
Oh, Hulk Hogan. Hulkamaniac. I remember the back of the day when he, him and the Andre the Giant. Oh, that was, that was cool. WrestleMania 3, I believe that was. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Good times. Good times. Yeah. Well, we thank you so much for your time. Uh, keep the family safe and keep yourself safe and all the kids, Lady Tigers, safe. And we hopefully will, whatever the new normal is, get to it shortly. But obviously a lot can happen yeah. between now and then. So um, enjoy the rest of your summer, and we hope to catch up with you soon. All right. Hey, thanks, Blair. I appreciate it. Good seeing you. Hey, thank you. You too, Tom.